We've got Sean McAfee. Hey, Sean, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for having me. Let me tell you a little bit about Sean here. Here's his bio. He can correct me if I miss something. He's a convert to the Catholic faith. He's a lay Dominican. He's a founder and editor of EpicPew.com. He writes for numerous uh, Catholic publications and resources, including the National Catholic Register. Those are the good guys, by the way. Not to be confused with the National Catholic Reporter. And he currently lives in New Orleans, Louisiana, with his wife, Jessica, and their six children. Well, welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah, no corrections. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And you wrote a book. It's a tan book. Uh, it's called Compendium of Sacramentals, Encyclopedia of the Church's Blessings, Signs, and Devotions. John, from what, from which Christian tradition did you come from? Which is just, actually, I do have one correction. It's not a tan book. It's a, it's a red book. Ah. I'm just kidding. That was a good joke. Okay, I'm a dad of six children, and you can't turn it off. It's by tan books. Um, what I came from Southern Baptist uh, denomination. I was wow. born and raised Southern Baptist. And about the time I got out and joined the military, I became really non-denominational, which I think kind of led me to the church. But it's interesting because nonetheless, Southern Baptist and non-denominational, those are rooted in very Bible only. And I can imagine what you were taught about Catholics. Those Catholics worship these objects called sacramentals and relics. I mean, that's that's quite a jump from Southern Baptist to Catholic to write in about sacramentals. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome home, brother. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, on that, I tell you what, in my household, we didn't talk a lot about other faiths unless it was like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. And it wasn't like slamming them, but it was like, hey, you know, these these don't believe in Jesus Christ. But we had a Lutheran church right down the street growing up. And I was like, and I remember I was like 14, 15 years old one day. I was like, Dad, why don't we go to that one? It's right there. He was like, well, we're not Lutheran. And that was it. That was enough for me. Of course, you know, in my early adult years, I became more curious, you know, why aren't we Lutheran or Anglican? So, yeah. So well, how, yeah, well, how did you come into the Catholic Church? You know, just give us a, a you know, just a, a quick uh, summary. Yeah, I got out of the Air Force and I, uh, I had an intense faith for the Lord and a desire to understand him and understand what he wants for me in my life. And of course, um, I wanted to seek truth. My wife bought me an apologetics Bible, which wasn't a Catholic. I think it was like an NIV translation. And I started going through there and just get enamored in, you know, really what scripture says about things and what we believe. And then I met a Catholic who really knew his stuff. Like this guy probably could have answered questions on the quick answers for Catholic answers. And, uh, and I tried to prove him wrong for weeks and weeks and weeks straight. And I just ended up, the more I read, the more I was like, why can't I be Catholic? Why, why am I not Catholic yet? And, uh, and I even told myself, you know, I can't, I, I don't really want to do this Christian thing anymore if I can't do it like this, like, like Catholics do. So I joined the church as soon as I could, got in on the next RCIA and, uh, yep, had my baptism affirmed. And now I've been Catholic for 12 years. Wow. Did you meet this guy in the military or outside of the military? No, he was a psychologist of mine after I'd gotten out of the military. Wow. I was dealing with some stuff. And, uh, you know, we I wanted a, faith, a faithful way to, to go about that and uh, gave it to me. Wow, he he sure gave you psychology. He gave you, uh, he gave you the fullness of truth. And you know what's funny is the basis of <laughs> psyche in the in ancient Greek is spirit. So yes, yeah. he gave me spiritualism. You know, study of spirituality, <laughs> theology. Uh, even though I was seeking, you know, stuff with my head. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, yeah, yeah, psychology actually, it's it, it it just the name, the definition. It's religious. It's spiritual and component. It's not secular. It's not godless. And That's so, right. God bless that guy for uh, for uh, being uh, uh, an undercover apologist working, uh, you know, daylight, you know, working uh, moonlighting as a psychologist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He did a good job. Yeah. So, Sean, tell us a little bit about your book is called Encyclopedia of the Church's Blessings, Signs and Devotions. Well, why do you even want to write a book like this? I mean, what what uh, inspired you to write a book about sacramentals? Yeah, the pitch that I made to Tan, it was super easy. I had done a book for Catholic Answers, one of their 20 answer series books, Defending Sacramentals and Relics. And that was like, there was a word count there, if you're familiar with the series, because they all got to kind of be the same thickness. Yeah. Um, 
but I, and it was like 18,000 words. But by the time I had finished writing that book, I knew that I had enough for like a very high volume, high page count mm-hmm. or volume of words. And I, and I wasn't able to say everything that I wanted to say. And, and of course I didn't get to discover everything that I wanted to discover. Um, part of the joy of writing is discovery. So I was able to pitch this book to Tan. I just wanted to kind of create one of their manual books, you know, Hey, here's what they are. Here's how to use them. And they gave me the opportunity to do this gorgeous book with all these pictures. And they said, Hey, we've got this compendium series. You know, there's two others before this. Is this what you're, is this something you're interested in? They didn't have to sell me on it. I was like, of course I'll do that. What a privilege it was to write this book. You know, it's got sacred art on just about every page or an image of the sacramentals we're talking about. So Mm. really the curiosity drove me, but of course I just wanted to give Catholics something to show their, to to boost their appreciation uh, for sacramentals. And of course, thwart them to use them and practice them in their own life. Sean, is there anything even remotely close to sacramentals in the Protestant expression, Southern Baptist fundamentalist? Yes and no. Uh, Our definition is very crisp, but maybe we can get into that. But it involves the intercession of the church in endorsing them and making them at all efficacious. Um, But I would say, yes, uh, Protestants might not realize that they have things like crucifixes. They still have Ash Wednesday. Um, Mm -hmm. They still do things with palm branches and ashes, and and even some do things with salt. Um, Of course, our liturgical brethren, the Anglicans and the Lutherans, yes, they they're they're quite um, sacramentalized. uh, But you know, the the more non denominational, they might it might be subtle, but it's still there. It's something that they're not realizing that they're they're doing. Yeah, you know what? It is subtle because uh, when I was a cop and I worked with a lot of non denominational Christians, uh, brothers in in uniform, they. uh, a lot of them, we, you know, we, we would get to talking about faith and a lot of them would say, yeah, just, you know, for nightmares, what I do is I just grab my Bible and I sleep under my Bible and the nightmares go away. So they, they even kind of understand that you, there, something physical can can give actual grace, you know, and some of them would tell me, oh, yeah, when I have a nightmare, I just grab my Bible and my, on my nightstand and I just hold it up in the air and uh, and 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 all my nightmare goes away, the night terror. So. Right. They they even kind of understand that 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 uh, Christianity needs to be incarnational. So how do we define sacramentals? Great question. The church has been trying to put the right kind of definition on these since about the third century. You know, in the in the old oldest writings, whenever they would talk about things like holy water or even crucifixes and 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 things like that, things that have been around since the very beginning, they would call them sacraments. But of course, they weren't saying that. They weren't saying that they were efficacious modes of grace for the church to to be sanctified. These are things. Um, the the definition in particular is they're they're sacred signs that bear resemblance to the sacraments, and through the intercession of the church, they're supposed to dispose us to go and have that sanctified lifestyle, a sacramental lifestyle, going and receiving the sacraments. You know, the Eucharist. Um, participating in mass, uh, being baptized and so on um, to get us into the kingdom of heaven by sanctifying our lives. So this is, this is a question for any Protestants that would be listening. Cause this is exactly where uh, they would want this answered. Is there a biblical basis for sacramentals? Totally. First of all, sacramentals are broken into three categories. They're not just rosaries and crucifixes and things like that. First of all, the first, the first, def, the first, breakdown for sacramentals category is blessings. Of course, blessings are there from the very beginning. From the oldest patriarchs, you know, um, Joshua blessing his children, um, all the way to Jesus and the apostles, you know, blessing people. Those are uh, sacramentals. Those are actually the primary form of sacramentals is blessing. So that is riddled throughout the Bible. Mm-hmm. Second is exorcisms. We don't find a lot of exorcisms in the Old Testament. The only one we really find hard evidence of is actually in the book of Tobit, uh, where the angel Raphael, he is commiserating with the downcast Tobit, and he asks him to perf- asks him to use the ashes of a burnt fish in order to heal, a, heal, a, heal somebody. So that is uh, the, the oldest representation of a, of a uh, uh, exorcism in the Bible. Um, you might be able to point to other remo- removals of evil, uh, you know, cleansing and things like that. That's really what we're talking about with um, uh, with exorcisms. But the third form is, of it, course, it, it, let the- me just jump in, Sean. And that's a good point that you make about the book of Tobit, because Tobit, it wasn't just a prayer that dispelled the demon, but there was actually something physical. There was yes, a exactly. physical instrument that he used. And of course, we know that as as Christians, 
that the fish is a symbol of Christ, you know, that uh, the, I think it's yep. ichthus in Greek. Mm-hmm. And so, again, it's, uh, it, it's representative of Christ. But again, there was something physical that he used to drive out the diabolical. Yes, and another great example of that is we talk about the the third order, which is the physical and non-physical pious devotions and, and items of piety. Um, we can point to the story of Elijah where he uh, used the bones of a dead man to, or he he blessed the bones um, of the dead man in the pit to, to raise him back to life. Um, that is right there. I mean, that actually counts all three sacramental types. Um, but I like to think that there are plenty. I mean, there is a there are numerous sacramentals in the in the New Testament. First of all. Um, you know, Jesus uses dirt and spit, the mixing of those to heal the blind man. Now, he could have done it without that, but he chose to do it that way. And he is the master. So um, there's that. Uh, blessings exist throughout the New Testament. The cloth in, in Acts chapter 19 of Peter and Paul was touched. And that's kind of like a second class relic, but that was touched. It was sacramentalized in order to heal um, the lepers uh, in that chapter. Um, and we find other, of course, symbols of Christianity or of sacramentals in the early Christian church, which is clearly passed on. Those are the first generation passed that tradition from the apostles. You know, these are the people creating crosses, carving crosses everywhere they possibly could, signing themselves in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was kind of like a secret handshake, but it is our most prevalent sacramental is to cross ourselves. And this is what we find right at right in the biblical age. Yeah, we even find uh, that making a sign of the cross in your forehead in the book of Ezekiel, I think. I think it's chapter 9 where the Israelites, God told the Israelites that had not uh, bend their knee to false gods to cross their to cross their forehead with a T or with a cross. And uh, the angels would spare them from death. And those that didn't have the cross on their forehead, uh, they would be uh, they would receive a covenant judgment from God. Uh, so right. yeah, we see that we, you're right. You're right. We see that all yep. over the old, old Testament as well. Yeah. We describe it in the book too, you know, just to go a step further than that. The, the, the oldest descriptions we have of the Paschal lambs, uh, of the, of the Paschal lamb sacrifice, it's a very descriptive, uh, analysis on how, and this comes from like the third or fourth century comes from an analysis to say that that. Uh, lamb was actually skewed crosswise through the shoulders and up the spine. So mm-hmm. that was literally in the sign of a cross, the Paschal wow. lamb being sacrificed and and cooked that way he, he for the consumption of the people. He was cut open with a, a, a cruciform. Yes, wow. exactly. Wow. Well, that's yeah. fascinating. Once again, I mean, uh, there's no coincidence why, why God would have that happen. He's yep, just saying, exactly. are you guys listening? Are you listening? My son will be uh, sent in uh, 1,200 years after Moses, and he will be yeah. the sacrificial lamb. So, Sean, uh, how, how do we get? How did we as Catholics get sacramentals? How did that d- organically develop from you know Saint Paul blowing his nose, Jesus using spit and mud, the the bones of of, of Elijah in his tomb, uh, Saint Paul Peter's uh, shadow falling upon people and being healed? So. Those are the the early forms of of, of of physical instruments being used to to confer grace. How do we get from that to the economy of sacramentals as Catholics now? That's a great question, man. I'm just thinking in my mind like there are so many ways to answer it. First of all, it's completely grassroots, and this isn't something that the church was like, "Hey, we got to find a way to attract people, uh, so let's take the physical world around us and." Um, let's baptize it or something like that's actually a great answer. Um, but the practice of probably having physical objects to show us the truths of our faith goes way back. We talked about Old Testament concepts. Well, I mean, so one of the objections just to kind of take a long way of answer this. The one of the objections is that sacramentals break the first commandment, which is don't do not create any image of any God or have any God before me or, or create any images of anything in heaven in heaven or below. But he did instruct us to make. Uh, the seraphim and the cherubim on top of the mercy seat of the of of the um ark of the covenant of the ark of the covenant covenant right and there is even the the section in uh the old testament that talks about the god commanding them to pass over the column that they've he, char- he charged them to uh image a, image a snake which is actually an image of christ by the way people mm-hmm. don't realize that um, and that that would be a source of healing for his people. So this this idea of having these things, you know, bells on the on the uh, the breastplates of the high priest's uniform, you know, these are things that the the Jewish people were well familiar with. So by the time.
time that they converted, they were thinking, well, how can we take what God has given us as he has and produce our faith through it, right? To enhance our faith through it. Like I said, to direct us to the sacraments, because that's really all that Jesus did was he said, hey, all that stuff that I was teaching you for thousands of years and that's in the Torah and whatnot, I'm pointing to the truths of Christ, uh, of this new law, this new covenant, this new way of having your faith. This is the real, realization of what we're doing. So the church has, has actually not stopped making sacramentals. In fact, we're still doing it. Um, and what the church tells us in Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the Vatican II document for the um, – for the constitution on sacred liturgy mm. is they say that this is almost a quote. They say nothing couldn't be, they say almost anything could be sacramentalized to teach the faithful of the truths of the, of the church. So, so we have stopped at nearly nothing to adopt, to baptize and take the, take the world around us and say, well, how can this point us and encourage us to live a life of sanctification? I can go on about each individual sacramental, but that's kind of a, a long, a, a better way of answering it from a grassroots perspective. Well, I'm going to ask you about each sacramental probably in the, in the last segment, uh, maybe, you know, so the, the big ones, I'm going to ask you about the biggies uh, yeah. in the last segment. So what is the proper care of a sacramental or its disposal, its disposal. Right now, I know there's somebody just sending an email. I've got a f- various emails that there's a fake. And here's what was, the email says. Jesse, I, I received a fake St. Benedict's medal, probably made in China. I don't know where. And they said it's fake because uh, some of the words did, were not consistent okay. with, uh, with the actual St. Benedict's medal that they have received pr- before. So they said, how do I dispose of this fake St. Benedict's medal? So I'll, I'll let you answer that. Uh, you that's know, fascinating. What's the, what's the, yeah. What's the proper that's, care of a sacramental or yeah. disposal? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually great that they, they noticed that, uh, first of all, because it's easy to it's easy to kind of come across, um, you know, illicit materials like that, especially with that example, because as we point out in the book, the uh, the priory of uh, Monte Cassino is the only authorized maker of the St. Benedict medal. Now they have delegated that role as they've seen, but they are, you know, they are the authority of the safekeeping mm-hmm. of that metals, uh, Interesting. IP, so to speak. Wow. So, so that's really cool. Now sacramentals, the church wants us to care for them. These are not just ordinary objects. These are not just, uh, you know, after it's blessed, especially, which I encourage anybody out there with a sacramental to have it blessed by a priest or to find the right kind of investor for it, investiture for it. Um, but whenever we're talking about caring for them, we're probably talking about like, how do we dispose of them? Or just in case yeah. Yeah. Um, something is ripped, like a scapular is ripped or a rosary is broken. I've got six children and I'm telling you, I have had to mend a lot of rosaries, but some of them are beyond repair. So what do we do with those? The church says that we should dispose of them in accordance with the dignity of those objects. So just like we bury people, they ask us to bury sacramentals or to incinerate them um, in any sort of fire. Uh, the church doesn't really prescribe exactly, but those are the two suggestions that we make. But what they don't want us to do is just throw them away like any old ob- object. We don't just want them to end up in the landfill. These are things that have been consecrated. Some of them, like a chalice, that's a sacramental. Um, vestments, those are those are treated in a special way. Um, and so we have to, like the church says, to treat them with the dignity that belongs to them. Amen. My backyard is full of uh <laughs> my, my backyard is a gra- it's a graveyard for for sacramentals that have been uh disposed of properly so Good. how do you answer a non-catholic who says that sacramentals are superstitious a violation of the first commandment yeah well i think we uh not to not to skip over that that question but you know we talked in the first segment or maybe it was the second segment last segment about yeah. about the first commandment and really it does it does point to the second commandment too is you're not supposed to bow before them well we render our hearts to god as the psalm says we rend our hearts to god and that is what makes it an acceptable sacrifice not not all of our superfluous words and prayer or, or even the beauty of these sacramentals because some of them are quite ornate that doesn't make them any more valuable or it certainly doesn't as we pointed out already doesn't drive their efficaciousness um, but what does is is the movement of our hearts our ascent to what these things represent so if we see they see us bowing to them or kissing our crosses or even our thumb after making the sign of the cross right before the gospel reading um 
we can we can take that to mean that our heart and our behavior is assenting to the truth that we find with these things. People have been saluting people for years. People have been bowing to things for years, genuflecting mm -hmm. to things for years. Why do we pick out when we bow to the altar, you know, such a such a crime um, when we when we believe that Christ is crucified there or or, or that we re -cru crucify Christ there? Um, so so that's a way to to answer that question. What, what did that did that hit all of the <laughs> points there? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, the superstitiousness, right? right? So some people I think can be superstitious, and we'll get into it with the Sabatine privilege and um, or somebody hanging a rosary from their uh, from their car uh, mirror rear view mirror. Um, that's these things aren't supposed to stop bad from happening. They are there to be interceded by the church in order to move us to devotion and worship of God. Yeah, and they're supposed to, they're not a decoration, they're not costume jewelry, like a lot right. of the rich and famous, uh, they're there to be used. Uh, right. So, I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite sacramental? Or maybe you have a few, you have a, maybe you got about two or three silver bullets. Which, which yeah. one are your go-to sacramentals? I'm a promise lay Dominican, so I would say my white scapular, which I, I actually rarely wear unless I'm at a, an official function or wear it to a special mass. I, I hardly wear that. Um, okay. But I do also wear a um, I do also wear a St. Dominic's cross and those are reserved for us. So they're very special to me. Um, but I do also wear a medal that I had blessed. It's a medal of, with the sign of Ravenna on it, the two little birds drinking from the fountain. Um, my wife wears it, too. And it's kind of in addition to our wedding rings. You know, this is kind of our sign of our not just of our marriage, but of our our matrimonial union um, in faith. Um, those are definitely my favorite, but I love all sacramentals. Um, I like my holy water. I've got a little bottle of Easter water there that I bless the kids with when we do comp line. Um, and all of them mean something to me. Of course, all of them mean a little something different, uh, but they're all very special to me. Yeah, uh, I think I would probably say that holy water is the most common sacramental for Catholics. Uh, yeah, definitely for, the most common physical. Yeah, the most common physical. The most common one is a sign of the cross. Obviously, right. that's the most common sacramental for Catholics, but the most common physical one, you would agree that it would probably be holy water, correct? Yeah, it and it is used. I can't think of a sacrament. I can't think of a sacrament that it's not used in. So, yes, it is absolutely the most common. And the tradition of the churches, you probably wrote about this, that the epiphany blessing of the holy water, uh, that holy water seems to be the most efficacious holy water uh, that we can use is, is, uh, have you done the research on that, Sean? It's definitely the sp most special <laughs> it involves actual ingredients. You know, the old Testament in, um, the book of, yeah, actually there is an old Testament recipe that I call it, uh, for, mm. for holy water where the book of, Oh, well, we'll find the reference later. There is an Old Testament reference that where they say that the priest should sweep up in the temple the dust and add it to water and bless it. And that would be a sign for the people. Um, that's so cool, isn't it? I mean, we should have mentioned that in the first segment. Are there Old Testament references to it? It's right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, I think it's in the book of Numbers. It's in Numbers or um, I'm losing my vocabulary here. Yeah, What's the yeah, one that yeah, starts yeah. with a C? <laughs> Chronicles. It's in Chronicles. It's like in chapter 28 or something oh, okay. like that. It's okay. definitely referenced in the book. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I got I, I, I've uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking with you. We're talking to Sean Mac McAfee here. He's a lay Dominican Catholic, lay Catholic convert to the Catholic faith from different Protestant denominations. He's probably run the gamut of Protestantism. And uh, he's uh, the father of six, uh, lives with his wife, Jessica, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Get the book, Compendium of Sacramentals. Encyclopedia of the Church's Blessings. There it is. It's by 10 books, but the book is not 10. But it's by 10books.com, 10books.com.